Hey, good afternoon, everyone. In the previous class, we talked about our syllabus, uh, my expectation, and what you might see in this class. And also, we talked a little bit of uh, uh, the big data era, what makes uh, data to be considered as a big. We talked about four challenges or four main points, which are volume, variety, velocity, and veracity. So these are four important uh, things. And okay, now let's go to the uh, main point that data has a value. And if you want to get hired in a company, they expect you guys to uh, find those values and basically uh, provide those value for your managers and let them make important decisions. So one of the tools and platform that, you need, uh, that helps you to provide value, especially for big data, is uh, Hadoop and Spark environment, which uh, you spend a big portion of this semester class to learn about them. Um, so these are some. Oh, what happened? I, I don't see that here. Okay, so as you see, here I listed some values like product recommendation, predicting demand, marketing analysis, uh, fraud detection, so on and so forth. So these are pretty much similar to other data sets that you had in, um, I mean, the value of other data sets you have seen in uh, your previous classes. So you might say, what's the differences? Actually, uh, we, uh, we are getting to more practical uh, scenarios because in your, let's say in for your Python course or statistics course, so you have a very small data set. And right now, if you get a job in most, and most like in the good companies like the Fang, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, uh, Google, those kind of things, they have, uh, their data is much more than this. And on top of just having a very small table, what I mean small table, even two, two gigabytes seems a small for those businesses. So the, uh, people in, in those organizations, need, uh, they need um, some platforms, uh, first of all, to process the data, to store the data, make it ready for applying some algorithms or machine learning tools that you are aware of. So basically in this course, uh, our scope is much larger. And also we are we considering the whole map, everything from uh, handling a very large data set and preparing for making analytical analysis over those data. It would be great if you don't need it. I mean, you can work on a single standalone, a standalone computer and have a, let's say, very really small data set. But I mean, most likely if they want to hire you, they hire you for something difficult, not uh, straightforward, just applying Python, those kind of things. Okay, so we are going to add this, these two challenge or problem. First, uh, let me just read it. How can we reliably store large amount of data on a, uh, at a reasonable cost? How can we analyze all the data the, that we have stored? I talk about it. So yeah, let's see, um, look at the storage challenge that, I mean, it, it was even from 1950s and 40s. So this is the cost and volume of, I mean, Look at the weight, even it's very hard for two a strong guy to load that hard drive, five megabytes. Five megabytes is nothing. Just a, even a, a, a really good picture could be more than five megabytes. The good thing, the, price, the storage price is just going lower and lower. So look over like 1997, two gigabytes cost 150. Seven dollars in two fifteen point like three thousand gigabytes or three terabytes 
cost 0 0.029 per gigawatt. I'm just going uh, even lower right now. So this figure should be updated in near future. However, the uh, processing capabilities on, on uh, I mean, the processing capabilities uh, increasing drastically. You might have a Moore's law, which every 18 or two, 18 months or two years, almost two years, the processing uh, speed uh, would be doubled. However, still the, uh, uh, the pace of the processing power is not as fast as the storage capabilities. And even the processors of your PCs and laptops is the most expensive part in your system. Giving, uh, having said that, uh, I mean, the, the amount of increase in the data is much more than increase our processing power and seed processing is very expensive. So, um, one solution is, okay, so it's, uh, storing the data is not, is very cheap, fairly cheap. The processing is very expensive. So one way for processing a large amount of data is making a supercomputer. So we have like Harvard has a supercomputer. Here we have a, I don't call it Kirk as a supercomputer, it's a like very, but it's a very powerful cluster we have here. Each state has a supercomputer. Uh, so it's one way is just doing that. Another way is, which is more economical and more applicable. So instead of investing too much for a supercomputer, make a, uh, a civil and powerful uh, computing centers, but let's divide your processing in multiple locations instead of just one location and just copy your data multiple times. So instead of having, uh, let's say, instead of having an expensive cluster clock, maybe each school could have a, a smaller processing unit, but we, we copied our data, let's say 10 times. So each school has a copy of the data. So whenever you want to do process, use a less powerful uh, computing unit. And each computing unit in each school just process one tenth of the data. So you don't have to process all the data together. It brings some challenges I talk later. So the, so the whole point of this course is how to have such a system that instead of having a supercomputer, uh, having a smaller, uh, uh, less powerful uh, computing unit, but processing 10 copies of your data at the same time. Or even Google, Google, ha Google has, I think, I'm not sure, but I think the US at least they have, well, I mean, multiple supercomputers, but even is not enough for Google. So Google, uh, may maybe first they had a center in San Francisco, but for based on because the data is growing crazy, so they have so many multiple computing units around the world for multiple reasons. First of all, handling a, a ton of processes. Some cases, let's say, yeah, I'm not sure if Google is accessible in China or not. I think there is some limitation, but. Let's say in India. So if you want to search something in India, doesn't make sense to send your order to San Francisco, then process and get back to India. So maybe they have a processing unit in India. So when you send the search, they just go to that center, much faster, much cheaper, and much reliable. Okay, so. So the bottleneck in such a situation is the access point and I mean the internet speed and um, how to handle those so many multiple units. Okay, let's talk about Baidu. Baidu is accessible in China, right? B A B A I D U, right? So yeah. so let somebody in Beijing wants to do some search. And uh, let somebody from Shanghai or Xinjiang. So there have been multiple police in the country. So it doesn't, it's much better to have multiple servers 
uh, alongside the country than just have one center in Shanghai. Much faster, cheaper, and much more reliable. So what do you think having uh, multiple processing units is more reliable? People over Zoom, you can use your mic too. So I, I said, if you have multiple processing units, your reliability is higher. So can anyone explain why? Yeah, right. Having said that, let's talk about India as an example. Let's say there's a server in New Delhi, another one, let's say in Bangladesh, this is the neighboring country. Even if the, uh, let's say, India servers is, uh, get out of the circuit, they, they have another closed super company in Bangladesh. So instead of sending the uh, process, uh, their process to San Francisco, they can send it to neighboring country. So we are more reliable, the reliability is higher. Or in the Chinese uh, example, let's say it, they just have one center in Shanghai and for some reason uh, that center got broken. So whole of the Baidu company would be out of business because they cannot process other requests. But if they have multiple processing units in the country, even Shanghai, like Beijing, a processing unit got out of the circuit. There's still another multiple units, let's say in Inner Mongolia or like in Xinjiang, so they, they can use other uh, places. So having multiple units is, is good for a business. It's not only cheaper, it's more reliable. Uh, uh, you, can, you won't be out of business by just losing one center. But at the same time, you should copy your data in multiple locations. So let's say uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Inner Mongolia, every location has, should have a copy of your data. I think we talked about that. And it's much easier to uh, scale your business. So let's say first you're a startup. So you have just pro one processing unit in San Francisco. Then uh, you increase your business. You make another processing unit in like Arizona, Boston. So with a cheaper cost, you can increase. Also, it's very easy to scale your business and much more uh, economical. What about security? Do you think if you have multiple processing units in the multiple locations, do you increase your security or decrease? It should be. What? It should be. Why? Because it's more different ways to get it. Yeah, there's more exposure, sure. Yes. So, this figure explains uh, what I talked so far. So, you have to, when you increase your uh, uh, I mean, when your business increases, you have multiple processes. So one way, having one, one expensive unit that can handle the that. Another way, in that figure, I have cheaper processing unit, which the blue circuits are the cheaper processing unit. But as you see, I copied my data three times because I had three proce uh, processing location. Each time, one processing unit uh, processed one third of my data. Okay, so let's say I have so many numbers. Let's say I'm uh, different customers who purchase over Amazon. Let's say you have, actually one of my classmates is hired in Amazon. He's doing such a thing. So uh, let's say we have billions of orders from Amazon. And we want to get a mean price or an average of the price the customer paid. So seems easy, right? So one third of the data, you find the mean of one third of the data. And again, you find the mean of all those three means and you can get the overall mean of the price. What about median? Do you think we can do for the median? Uh, uh, money that my customer paid or the Amazon. Let's say I have the whole Amazon inventory, I mean the data inventory, and I want to 
to find the median purchase that they made last 10 years <laughs> or last year, whatever. This is your next assignment, actually. So uh, I don't want to you, you guys provide a mathematical solution for that. Uh, just uh, by try and error, just make some num random numbers. You don't have to have too many numbers. Maybe even 10 or 12 numbers is enough. Let's see if it's possible or not. So in the first case, which you just have one copy and process is super easy, very straightforward, it's similar to what you learn in Python or a statistical courses. Let's uh, have three copies of your data. And each time look at the one third of your data and try to find the mean. And uh, let's see if it's, sorry, median. Then let's see if uh, in that way, if you divide your data in three ways, can you find the overall median correctly or not? Just do it by try and error. If 12 is, is not too much numbers, maybe consider 33 numbers. Or like, instead of three units, now you can consider five units. So, but the, your assignment, let me just go to your assignment. So, I think I should first exit here. So. So you have more than two weeks. So it's like, you don't have to submit it right now. Uh, I'm not sure if it's simple or complicated. So second assignment, which is like, you have 19 days. So, uh, but can you calculate the mean and median correctly if you distribute your numerical calculation over multiple nodes? Try to investigate by some numbers. So multiple nodes means like multiple locations. So what I mean from node computation, units should be easy assignment and i'm pretty sure if you google you can find the answer and you can help each other too so uh, for this assignment i don't consider cheating if you help each other over telegram okay any questions so far from you guys or people over zoom For your friends over Zoom, I should, because most of you actually over Zoom. So let me wait one or two minutes for them. So I'm, if they don't have any question in one or two minutes, I go to the next slide. No, thank you, Professor. Somebody said thank you, but I'm not sure if they had question or not. Oh. The weird thing is very hard for me to see. No, that's okay. Okay. Okay, just wait one more minute, so. No, overall mean, median. Let's say you have, let's say you're in the second day of Amazon, 15 people made purchase from you. Uh, uh, can you uh, uh, calculate the median correctly or not? So each time uh, you just focus on one third of your data, find the median of one third. And you're totally blind. Each processing unit or each node is totally blind of other nodes. So you calculate median of each part separately. Then you look at the median of those three medians. Maybe you can find the overall median. Is it the correct median or not? No worries, if you answer uh, wrong, that's fine. Because I, it's, uh, you know, for this problem, we don't follow a mathematical solution that you should prove. Maybe you pick some numbers and end up based on your numbers, maybe your answers are different. So I don't care if half of you said yes, half of you said no. It depends on which numbers you pick. But I think if you Google it, you can find them even mathematical solution. So. Okay so. okay, so this is the overall process. We copy the data into, uh, let's say if it, it's most likely for the startup companies. Let's, let's say you have a contact with Amazon. So you copy your data over 
Amazon Cloud. And in Amazon, they, all, they copied your data in multiple location. I think depends on the, uh, I mean, service that you want to use, you can identify how many centers or how many nodes you want. So if you say you ask five nodes, the Amazon AWS copy your data five times. And over the cloud, you do your process, and get the data back. And we do it in one of your assignments, actually we do that. We connect to Amazon AWS, we ask for nodes, then process the data and get the results back. So for, for such cases, Amazon run uh, big data infrastructure, Hadoop and Spark in the background. So it's much easier because, and they charge you for that. So they handle the background. So for this case, you need a very large bandwidth because that's a, uh, you ask Amazon for a very large process. If it's a two, like few uh, gigabytes or some terabytes, still maybe you can do on your system. So let's say you want to process 100 terabytes of the data. So you should be able to load that amount of data over Amazon. So bandwidth is a really challenging thing. For your class project, you don't have to work with a very large data set because at the end we want to see if you're able to process it. So maybe if you get job somewhere and in that location, uh, you upload uh, very, very large data. Okay, these are the main challenges for any big data processes. Availability, we talked about that data consistency. So we might uh, you copy your data multiple locations, so each location should be have exact same data. Synchronizing the processing, bandwidth, I mean, failures, or cas cascading failures, it just means multiple failures together. So, okay, but so what Hadoop does, uh, basically this is, is similar to operating system, but it's not. Or maybe you can say, if you don't want to be very uh, correct, you can consider it's a like operating system that manage so much physical units, send the requests, manage the copies, get the results back. So when you uh, ask Amazon to do a big data process for you, they have their own version of Hadoop and Spark. So with the Hadoop, they manage your data, they run the processes and get the results back. Let's say you work in a, a, a highly secure organization. Sometimes, they do, or many times, they don't want to give outsource the processes to Amazon or Google. They, maybe they want to invest more and do it internally. So in those cases, uh, they need the Hadoop engineer who can run the codes and just manage those uh, nodes and uh, be able to run those processes. And this course, you learn uh, some important parts of Hadoop. So you, do, you don't have to rely on Amazon. You, you, you run the Hadoop from the core side. So you would have some core experience of the Hadoop. Hadoop has two major parts or two main components, which is for, I mean, obviously a storage system, Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS and processing part. The processing part, we call it MapReduce or more extensively map sort and reduce or map shuffle reduce. I explain um, later. So basically, the Hadoop that you would learn, uh, make multiple copies of your data in multiple nodes, take care of synchronization. Also, let's say two nodes got broken. Hadoop can figure out how to, how to use other nodes and how to uh, synchronize all the processes and they get the results back to you. So let, later, uh, you run Python code over Hadoop ecosystem. So your Python code communicates with the Hadoop and Hadoop run, uh, run those pro Python processes over multiple nodes. So we go one step under Python. So we get to more to the core side. 
I just talk about uh, fault tolerance, which just means how, let's say, the major point of using Hadoop is running multiple processes on multiple nodes. What happens is, let's say, half of them uh, cannot communicate, maybe bandwidth, even power issues. So this is one of the major advantages of uh, uh, Hadoop or HCFS system. Let's see. Okay. Any questions so far? So if I make it much easier and much in a very naive way, is like you work with the Python and want to learn how to, how your Windows works. It's not exactly correct, but I just want to simplify things. So right now, um, uh, each unit of the HDFS, which is again Hadoop distributed file system, it uh, is 100 megabytes. They are going to increase it, but the general standard is uh, 100 megabytes. It run over some Unix style uh, system. So later when we work with the Hadoop code, so you can see it's very similar to some Unix code if you have uh, some experiences. Uh, one th thing about the Hadoop and what makes it different from uh, other file system. In other file system, when you copy your data in the location, you can modify it, maybe you uh, uh, add or remove some part. But in uh, Hadoop, you, don't, you, ne you never modify. You just, it's just like a dump location that you dump your data somewhere, but in the way that you can manage it. So you can just retrieve your data and process it. So let's say if you want to edit some part of your data, you just load it, edit it, and copy it somewhere else. Mm, so basically, how to first develop by Google. Then they, through the Apache project, they made it uh, publicly available. So right now, there is so many um, uh, people, maybe you in the future, they work on the Hadoop ecosystem and uh, through the Apache project, they just add or remove some part, they try to improve. Uh, so Hadoop is now publicly available and many companies are running. So. Databricks, Amazon, Google itself, and so many other companies are, I mean, are developing Hadoop right now. Um, let me talk about that. Okay. So let's talk, see about the hardware part. So there is two general structure. Uh, one is, this is one structure. So you have a massive node and some slave nodes or data nodes. So I don't like a slave name. So let's say like five data nodes. So you have a master node or name node. It, it, the, uh, what name node, node does is just manage all of the data nodes. So it get the, your request, process it, look at the, all the data nodes, see which one is available, manage the data and process it over the data node. Basically the data node does the actual job, but all of them are managed by your name nodes. These are some comments that later we work. So no worries, I let me skip right for now because we work with those uh, comments, uh, or comments later. So, so the methodology behind the Hadoop is map reduce. So map reduce or map sort and reduce is nothing just how to distribute your data in multiple locations, how to sort the data, how to run the operation and get the results back. So the whole process name is map reduce. I made a short video here by myself. So to explain, uh, let me just. Um, 
Oh, there's some questions here. We cannot, how we can find data set for the homework to find mean and, okay, regarding your friend's question about the data set, you make your own data set. So you make some random numbers and see if you can find the mean and median correctly. So there is no data set for your homework. You just make your own data set. So it's the reason I told you your answers might be different because of you just make random numbers. Uh, I think I should, somewhere I should share my uh, computer voice with them. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I want to share my uh, computer as a speaker with them, voice with them, but I'm not sure where is that. I'll oh, share some. Okay. Uh, okay, look at this example. I want to count the numbers over the card. So I want to see how many hearts I have, how many spades I have. So I do it by uh, map reduce methodology or like Hadoop methodology. So first I make uh, multiple copies of my cards, then sort them. Sort what I mean from sorting, let's put all the hearts, one location, all the spades, and other cards. Then count the number and report the number. So the reporting part is reduced. So map, sort, reduce. It just means uh, make multiple copies, sort your data based on your work, and get the results back. Then the, general, the technical term for this job is map reduce. Oh. Today's lecture is about map reduce, which is Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about map reduce, which is a programming model for parallel processing. Hadoop and Spark are two well-known platforms that adopt this model. But let's explore it through an example. In this example, we are going to sum up numbers of the cards through map reduce. In the first step, we sort or shuffle the cars based on their type and map. To so I already had multiple copies. Now I'm already now I want to sort the data to the different computing nodes. In each node, we do image processing and count the numbers. However, these computations are done in parallel, so we save time in compared with sequential processing. In the last step, we reduce or summarize the nodes calculations in a report. You can perform this experiment with your colleagues and increase quantity of the cards to understand how map reduce could minimize the computing time through parallel processing. So for your assignment, then you have like almost 20 days. So you also have a shuffle or sorting step because for finding the median, you should sort your data in each part of the, uh, uh, I mean, your data set. So in that one, just sorting from the least to highest. So again, for your assignment, instead of cards, you have numbers, which is pretty much similar. So first, multiple copies, then you uh, sort them, find the medians, then report, then reduce. So the name is not that much fancy map reduce or map sort reduce, but it's the, just a technical term. Just keep in mind when you, you hear map sort reduce, it just means the overall process of the Hadoop ecosystem, how to do multiple pro, uh, process. So, 
Okay, let's look at this example. So we want to find each employee's uh, sales price. Uh, for some reason, we have some transcript there. Anyway. Okay, so let's say this is the large data set. So they divide the data into five sections. So then they sort them based on the names. And in the last step, they just sum up the sales of employees in uh, one report. So as you see, each map reduce might be slightly different. So don't be confused if some map reduce is a little different from others. Just keep in mind that the overall concept just means multiple copy, sorting your data, then uh, summarizing your uh, processes in one, one report. Transcript. Yeah, I'm not sure how to deactivate this transcript. Okay, any questions so far? Let me just wait a little bit for your friends or Zoom. Okay, so far we had, uh, we have seen uh, uh, like why in the uh, big data era, if especially if your company work with big data is uh, you might have multiple processes that work in the parallel. What's the benefits of that and what's the necessity? Also, uh, we know that we need something similar as operating system who can manage all the multiple copies and run multiple processes uh, at the same time and get, get results back. So on top, on top of that, the methodology behind of this uh, parallel processing is map reduce. So also let's look at two, I mean, again, two architect, arch, arch, architecture of uh, map reduce thing. So in overall, uh, you have a master or an, a name node who manage some data nodes and basically just send, uh, get the, your orders, send your order to those slave nodes, run the process and get the results back. So this is the first structure. So uh, we call it MRV1. So basically we have a master a diamond who divides job into uh, individual task and send it to data nodes uh, and manage them. So data nodes send the uh, result back to master node and master node is the node that makes the final report. Second structure is, is not very different, but here we have an application master. So uh, master node allocate cluster resources for a job and a certain application. So a slave node uh, has application master and node manager. So basically the application, uh, we have one application master for each application. Again, that application divides the jobs into multiple uh, data nodes, run the processes. So, and uh, we also have a node manager who uh, run all the, who manage, uh, who runs all the slaves nodes or manage all of those nodes. So first one, it's, it's just for one application. In the second architecture, you basically can have multiple architectures. So uh, after master node, you have a, application master who manage multiple applications on your data nodes. 
just uh, review by yourself. So I don't ask you what is uh, like the first architecture, second architecture. Just keep in mind when you see in some papers or some report, uh, when they talk about the application master or like master or what do they mean? So for these kind of structures, I don't expect you to memorize everything. Just generally know one. This is the simplest one. Uh, oh no, this one. You just have uh, one master node and one and some slave nodes. So for just one application. So you might have one advanced one, which you have multiple applications on your cluster. So after master node, you have application master and a node manager. So you can run multiple applications on your clusters. Yeah. Yeah, you can find them. I mean, this is again a simplified uh, version of it. So, I mean, I am pretty sure if you get hired in Amazon or Google, maybe like there's large inventory. And, but this is the overall structure. So you may not see exact same shape, something like this. But even if this is as big as this classroom, so it's still they have one section is the master node and we have some data nodes. Yeah. So master node, maybe you don't need the expensive master node because it doesn't do the process. You just send the process and just overview all those data nodes. But your data nodes are pr probably expensive because they run the actual uh, process. Yeah. I've seen some videos, I've seen some, something exactly similar to this uh, mainframe thing, but I mean, they are evolving and probably some companies they have different shapes, but uh, I mean, the overall structure is it's like just one master and some slaves, or you have one master who runs different applications, so do you have some application manager nodes? That's a good question, yeah. Actually, I have seen exactly the same shape too, but um, uh, good thing, yeah. Okay. Let's not talk too much for today. So, uh, so we talk about our, this is a kind of first lab, but not very, very, I mean, hard lab. So I ask you to install some platforms for, uh, as your, one of your assignments. So here yeah, I put the solution, but you know, let me just go by, the solution is one of some of your last slides. So I updated this figure. So oh, there it might be one question. Yeah, one of the question, your friend's question is about do we uh, use Python to sort the data? Yes, in one of your labs, I, uh, we use Python to sort, to run the map reduce by yourself, but it's not very practical. So uh, in, if you don't use Hadoop ecosystem, you should sort and do the map reduce by yourself. And it's very time, uh, very complicated, very time consuming, and it's not fun. So in that lab, you learn that instead of doing everything from scratch, maybe you can use Hadoop ecosystem that save a lot of time. But yeah, we have the experience of running MapReduce by ourselves. So instead of uh, having expensive uh, map node, uh, I mean, uh, master node and data nodes, we have a virtual like map node and data nodes. And you do map reduce over a virtual environment. And later we work, the, the actual environment we use, like uh, we also use AWS, this is actual environment, but it's over cloud, so you don't see it. Okay, so installing uh, Horton HTTP over a virtual box, or VMware it takes a lot of time, but I put all the steps here. So after down installing uh, 
virtual box, which I think is pretty straightforward. You just download next, next, and that's it, right? Shouldn't be very difficult for you. The whole of installation, I run it today. It took like about 40 minutes. So I don't expect you to finish. Like if you can finish that, it would be awesome, but I don't think so. So first step, as you see here, you import. There is other ways you don't have to follow me. Even if you Google it, there's, I think, one more one more way of installing had to port on over uh, VirtualBox. But just the way that I did, I click import here. Then there's, let me just maximize it. Um, then do you see a small yellow button? This is a browse section. I browse and found HTTP 2.65. Then I open it. The, um, the remaining is a straightforward next. See what I did. So I have four CPUs, but I don't want to allocate all of my CPUs for this thing because I'm running other things in the background. So I changed it to two. But for RAM, I have 32 gigabytes, so I have too, many, too much of RAM. So the default is eight. You can, if your uh, laptop is, I mean, fine with eight is okay, but maybe you can increase to 12 or 16. Just see how much RAM you have on your system. And just the amount of RAM you dedicate should be less than your actual RAM. So if your system has 16 RAMs, make it 12 or eight. But the default is eight, uh, uh, 8,000 megabytes or eight gigabytes of RAM. So. I changed the default to 16 and CPU from four to two. Then again, the remaining is just next. Okay, this step might take like 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And after this step, that might, it depends on your system and the internet speed that you have. So you have, Horton Sandbox HTTP over VirtualBox. The next is just a start. So you click a start. This is set, I think took like 40, like 30 minutes from me. So this is set after starting your first time HTTP, you might think you have some mistake and your system is not running. If your internet is very slow, it might take one hour because in this step, it just downloads so many uh, files so it might take a lot of time. Yeah, might take up to one hour. But as you see, I didn't do anything. Just the, the, mo the most important part, click on import. The remaining just next, next, next. Here I change the default. Again, next, 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 and the stuff. So the order process is easy, but this step, you might get disappointed because your virtual box and Hadoop doesn't do anything for a long time. So you might think you made a mistake, but that's okay. Again, just, I mean, you can do it now, but I, I'm not sure, I, I'm pretty sure you cannot finish it. If you can, it means you have a really good system. So if you've got some issues, just let me know. Uh, over my office hours or over Telegram, uh, we can um, just, see how can I help you. If you see this uh, picture, which you see for VirtualBox, this is your address. For VMware, this is your address. It means you installed correctly. So the default username and password is Maria underline DEV. So let me show you what happens. Um, okay, now I installed correctly. So. I click, I click on a star. Even now it takes time. So again, if you see it takes, it, so some part of installation, your system doesn't do anything, but in the background it does so many things. So no worries if you make, Pretty, I'm pretty sure you never make a mistake. Just might be your system takes uh, a lot of time to process. It. Okay. 
I, uh, this is, you know, here we are using Horton, uh, we are using Horton platform. This is a private company. Sometimes, even in the middle of your assignments, you get some uh, random errors because we are using a free ver version of a paid software. So that's okay. So even in future, if you see some errors, sometimes you just need to wait for two hours because it connects to a server in the portal. Sometimes their server has issues. So you get some random error. So in this course, never get disappointed. Probably you never make a mistake. Sometimes a private company is in the background and they have issues. But later we go over open source version of Hadoop. So in that, when we get to open version, you don't see any error or you never get frustrated because everything is done by yourself. So hopefully we don't make any mistakes. So look at here, I've used VirtualBox. Uh, so it said, welcome screen is HTTP localhost 1080. So localhost 1080. So just type the thing that you see in the screen. Most likely you don't see that today, but just see this is in the welcome screen. I, you would see that. And I post this video later, so nobody don't need to memorize it. So launch, new to HTTP launch dashboard. I got one error. So even now, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't connect to the server for some random. I told you, I mean, before your class, I run it, it, it worked. Right now it doesn't. So let me just, usually you don't see the error, but I'm not sure for some reason, let's see, change it to, so this is bad connection, so it cannot, connect to the server. So in those cases, you might wait for a couple of hours. Some for some time, many people connect at the same time. So it just gives those errors. So even if you see such a thing, you are good. Probably there's something wrong in the background. But as I said later, we use the, we install the open source version. So we don't, you don't see any gateway issue and error. So, but, if you see such a screen, it just means you are very good. You are good. But last time it pop up block, can it disable pop up blocker? But before it right before your class, it worked. So let's see settings. Uh, extensions. It's already disabled. Uh, let you do it in uh, Firefox. But you know, it's, let me even remove it. Okay, I removed it. It's a heavy, so I cannot open up Firefox, okay. So let's see if it works over Firefox or not. Okay, for some reason it worked over Firefox, not uh, uh, my Chrome. Maybe because of the pop-up uh, pop blocker, but again, so Maria Dev is the username and password, sign in. Ambori is the Indian name, what or not? It seems from Indian, Ambori. What does it mean in Hindu? Uh, not sure. So as you see, I mean, I know it, uh, you cannot finish now. So you might see some uh, red signs here. It just means 
it's just running different services. So it might take 20 minutes to all of them get green. It just means if they are not loaded yet. So that's it. I mean, so for your first assignment, install, uh, as you see, I have 27 errors. I mean, or warning. These are warnings. So just said process, whatever. Okay, so your first assignment. Uh, if you go to the lab one. Yes, yeah, sometimes you, you should just wait for them. Uh, okay. So install VirtualBox, install Hortonworks data platforms. And if you're a Windows user, install Putty. Otherwise, if you're a Mac user, just take a picture from your desktop so I understand you, you're a Mac user, you don't have to install. So you copy and paste three pictures in a Word file and just send it to me. Uh, I mean, not to me, actually, upload it on Moodle. Uh, it would be your assignment. Again, this uh, up to this point might take one hour, even if, even if you already download everything. So if we downloading HTTP might take two hours for you to reach to this point. And in some, for some minutes, maybe you don't see anything, but there's a lot of processes in the background. Any questions so far? Okay, let me wait for your friends over Zoom to see if they have questions. No, Professor, it's okay, thank you. Okay, I wait one minute for them. I think I only taught you too much and too many technical terms for today. So from next class, first we, we look over uh, not using Hadoop and doing everything from a scratch by ourselves, doing map with this by ourselves. And you might see that's a, very, a lot of headache and takes forever. So instead we use Hadoop and we use a, uh, basically a, Horton's Hadoop. So Horton used, um, let me just go over my Firefox. So there's two ways of working with Hadoop. Use the open source, which is in future, maybe you have to, that's much uh, reliable and you manage everything. Uh, another one using a paid version like Horton version or AWS version or Google version. So Basically, they made a dashboard like here. So instead of coding everything, you can use those dashboards to make your sure life much easier. It's like, um, have you ever worked with MS DOS or Linux? Yeah. So in MS DOS or Linux, you type all the commands, copy this to that location, do this, run this application. You have to type. But uh, we, instead of using Linux, uh, uh, you can, or I mean, instead of using command prompt in general, you can use Windows. So you just drag, draw. So it just makes your life easier. So for, for next few classes, we don't want to suck in coding. We want to see what's the differences of coding everything by yourself or using an application or dashboard like Horton Ambari. Then, okay, let's see. Then, uh, in the then we worked with the Amazon version of Hadoop. 
then also we do uh, we install uh, the local version of um, Hadoop on your system and do on your system too. And you see some differences of them. Okay, there's a question. When I open the virtual box, I cannot see the open address. Okay, let me turn off my virtual box. First of all, this is an assignment, but I don't want to uh, make you upset. So for many, for some of your assignment, I don't show you the solution. I ask you to Google and find the solution. Even for this one, you can easily Google and there's so much of YouTube video, you can see how to install Horton in virtual box. So step by step, I make your life harder, sorry, but it's the way that you learn. So uh, for this assignment, I gave you the solution, but keep in mind for some assignment, you should figure it by yourself because there's a ton of technology. Uh, if you don't have time, just go teach everything. But okay, after working, I just go to machine and ACPI shutdown. It's better to uh, close it in this way. Otherwise, in the long term, you might get several errors. So, okay, when you, uh, first time you open the uh, a virtual box, your virtual box is different. You don't see this. You see some like import option. So you click on the import, then take the downloaded Port, uh, port on uh, HTTP on your system. So it's different. So if you get this page, and then just get in, that means you're okay. If you get this page, it's, it means you're okay. But again, first time you start, it takes like 40 minutes to install. Okay, I didn't do the import part and everything, and I came up with this. Oh, that's okay. I mean, I think you can click on new and that's okay. I said there are different ways of uh, uh, getting to this. I mean, yeah, that's okay. I mean, there's not just one way. Even for your assignment, you might see different ways of doing your assignment. And all the ways are correct. Yeah, for, for assignment one, you need to submit three uh, screenshots of each platform. Uh, if again, if you're a Mac user, you, one of your screenshots is just your desktop. So I can see you're a Mac user, you don't have put it. But I mean, I already put them, my way of installing uh, Horton HTTP. If you are not happy with that, uh, you're not comfortable. You, I mean, there's two ways. One way just watching it again, or uh, you can just simply Google how to install Port on HTTP over virtual box. And there's so much of other videos that you can follow. Okay, is there any other questions from you guys or people over Zoom? Let's see. I don't see any question. Okay, one part of this class, uh, even right now from, for the installation, you have some questions, but when we go further, you run code, you might see so much of hassle, you're stuck somewhere, that's okay. So no worries. <laughs> this, is a this is a technology course. And you know, I don't go too much inside of uh, like concepts because this, I, mean, I don't think somebody would hire you for just understanding what is big data. They add, want you guys to run something and get some results. So most of your learning this course is just for stuck in somewhere, having some issues and trying to figure out different of, uh, way of doing uh, same jobs. Okay, I think it's too much for today. So please keep working on your assignments. Again, you have so far, in the first week, you have three assignments, but you don't have to submit all of them. So assignment one is your introduction. Lab assignment, I already gave you the solution. And for second assignment, it's just you try do by try and error and you have more than two weeks. So I think, although we have three assignments, but I don't think it's too bad. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Thanks.